Привет, this is Anton, and you're watching non-animated Antunes, or actually, I should be saying foreign Antunes. You see, after my history of animation styles and types video, a person by the name of Ashenen suggested an idea to me. Why not do a video of talking about USSR or Soviet animation, as not many people really know about these works. I mean, let's be honest, the history of animation styles and types video was mainly about United States animation. I only talked briefly about foreign animation mainly if they held some sort of historical significance. There are actually a lot of great artistic works that come out of the Soviet Union, but it's not just USSR that I think needs to be discussed. There is a plethora of animation out there from various countries that are unfortunately obscure to most people. When people think about the biggest names in animation, they usually come from the United States, Japan, maybe Canada, and to a lesser extent the United Kingdom. Nearly everything else gets little to no attention by comparison. Person. Not that I can't understand why that is, there is the issue with region locking, DVDs and Blu-rays, and of course the more obvious language barriers and cultural differences, and usually dubs are not always great, even if they don't censor anything. But why are you being so kind? Go before I throw you down on the ground and rape you! <gasps> Bless you, thanks. I sure get sick of playing the good guy all the time. However, animation is probably the most visual medium, and if you don't even understand what is being said, 9 times out of 10, you can still marvel at the expressive visuals. So I'm going to do a series of videos talking about the animation of different countries and unions, exploring what makes them stand out and why they might deserve being viewed and discussed. I will, as I have implied, start off with Russian animation, as it probably has one of the most interesting histories. And don't worry, the majority of it is not going to be propaganda like you might be thinking. I promise. So, comrade, prepare your hammer and sickle as we are about to dive into some freezing waters right after a word about our sponsor. Here's a message for anyone interested in video editing. Are you tired of bending over backwards for Adobe? Do you hate messing with freeware editors to even get them to work and then paying hundreds of dollars for basic effects and functions? Well, today I come to you with a solution to that problem, Filmora 9. When you start a new project in Filmora, you can just drop your video in there, and if the project and video parameters are different, you can change the project, no need to start over. Filmora has good compatibility on all relevant platforms. Setup is as easy as hitting a button. The effects look good and are surprisingly easy to use. This video took me a whole 10 minutes to edit in Filmora. Check it out in the description. It's free to use and I've enjoyed it quite a lot so far. If you really like it, upgrading to premium and getting access to exclusive filters, tools and more is only $39.99 a year or a one-time deal of $69.99 that comes with lifetime updates, keeping you and your content up to date and fresh. In the earliest point of the 1900s, the first Russian animator was Alexander Shiryaev, who was a principal ballet dancer and choreographer at the Marinsky Theater, and he made a number of pioneering stop-motion and traditionally animated films between 1906 and 1909. He built an improvised studio at his apartment, and it was there where he carefully recreated various ballets. He did so first by making thousands of sketches and then used handmade puppets to stage them. You could say he was one of the first to take a stab at rotoscoping, though he does it differently from other artists, since it's mainly from memory, not with the filmed source, he can immediately draw over the movements to mimic them. In 1910, the second person to independently discover animation was Vladislav Alexandrovich Starevich. A trained biologist, he started to make animation by using embalmed insects. His experiments helped him soon realize the possibilities of the art form of animation. His first few films were dark comedies on the family lives of cockroaches. I guess you can say he took the lesson of use the tools that you are given to heart. These cockroach shorts garnered such a claim that they earned him an award from Tsar Nicholas II. He created some other popular animated films, sometimes combining live action with stop motion. Those being The Night Before Christmas and A Terrible Vengeance, both from 1913. Starevich left Russia after the October Revolution, leaving the Russian animation industry paralyzed as a result of the loss of this pioneer. Russian animation was restarted in 1924 when Mizrapom Film released Interplanetary Revolution, satirizing the silent science fiction film Alita. 
It used cutout animation, which was called flat marionettes at the time, along with the constructivism art style and was developed independently by three artists – Nikolai Kodataev, Zenon Kamisarenko and Yuri Merkulov. These three were the ones who headed the first Soviet animation studio. In 1925, the same team along with Ivan Ivanovano, Vladimir Suteyev and the Bromberg sisters followed interplanetary revolution up with the government-backed China in flames. It ran with a kilometer of film and at 14 frames per second, ending up with a runtime of over 50 minutes, making it the first Soviet animated feature film and one of the first in the world. Around the same time, animator Alexander Bushkin and director Diga Vertov produced a number of agitprop animated shorts. Agitprop, if you don't know, is political propaganda, especially the communist propaganda used in Soviet Russia. They were made as propaganda cartoons that satirized the bourgeoisie, religion and western countries, drawn and animated in a sketch style. However, the industry started moving away from Agitrop in the late 1920s. In 1927, Mirkulov, Ivan Ivano and Daniel Cherkis directed the first Soviet cartoon aimed at children, Senka the African. In the same year, Ivan Ivano and Cherkis worked on the skating ring, another hand-drawn cartoon. It was written and directed by Y. Zhelyabushki and Nikolai Bartram, founder of the Moscow Toy Museum. In 1928, Nikolai Kodataev and the Bromberg sisters teamed up with Nikolai's sister Olga to produce a hand-drawn animated short that was based on traditional Nenets art, using a revolutionary technique of printing on thin celluloid. The short was called The Samoid Boy. The year 1929 saw the release of the cutout and cell animated short Post by Mikhail Chekanovsky. It was seen as a return to constructivism traditions and a big step forward as it was exported and widely shown successfully, changing the perception of animation as an art form in the USSR. It also became one of the first with a musical score and a voiceover. Mikhail and his wife Vera Chekanovskaya created a studio at Landfilm, the same studio where a number of distinctive hand-drawn and stop-motion films were created throughout the 1930s. The team created a process similar to Technicolor, actively applying color by using the original dye transfer process invented by Lenfilm's in-house specialists. In 1933, Mikhail and Vera collaborated with composer Dmitry Shostakovich and poet and dramatist Alexander Vredensky on the first traditionally animated Soviet feature, The Tale of the Priest and of His Workman Balda. The feature was a satirical opera loosely based on the fairy tale by Alexander Pushkin and stylized as Rosta posters. Despite many problems, including the infamous bullying of Shostakovich in a Soviet editorial, the film was nearly finished and had been stored at landfill. In 1941, however, almost all of it was destroyed in fire caused by the bombings of Leningrad. Only about two minutes of footage, what you're seeing right now, survives. In 1935, Alexander Plushko directed The New Gulliver, one of the world's first full-length animated movies. It was also one of the first that combined detailed stop-motion with the live actor. The New Gulliver featured 3,000 different puppets with detachable heads and various facial expressions, as well as innovative camera and technical tricks. The international success led Ptushko to create more animation using his puppet techniques. He opened his own division of 3D animation at Mosfilm, which also worked as a school for beginner animators. In four years, they created a dozen of stop-motion shorts. Most of them were based around Russian folklore. In 1939, Tushko directed The Golden Key, based on a popular Soviet fairy tale. Like The New Gulliver, it also combined stop motion with live action, but to a lesser extent. On a note about technique at this time, in 1933, Viktor Smirnov was given the task to study the animation processes at Disney and Fleischer Studios. Smirnov was, at the time, the head of the Amkino Corporation, a New York-based company responsible for distribution of Soviet movies in the US. Smirnov, Alex Alexei Rodakov, Vladimir Suteyev and Pyotr Nosov started developing their own Disney style. Viktor Smirnov returned to Moscow in 1934 and founded the Experimental Animation Workshop. In 1935, Walt Disney himself sent a film reel with Three Little Pigs and various Mickey Mouse shorts to the Moscow Film Festival. These shorts had a great impression on Soviet animators and officials.
In 1936, the studio Soyuz Multifilm was created, and animators studied directing and drawing, and even the basics of acting and music, concentrating mainly on the Disney Golden Age style. Ivan Ivanovana directed Moidodir, based on the children's poem of the same name, which he credited to Disney for giving him the inspiration. Other artists tried their takes on this style, with Vladimir Sutev and Lamis Bredis presenting their own Uncle Stjopa adaptation. Leonita Malrik and Vladimir Polkovnikov adapted the stories of Dr. Ibolit into a distinctive miniseries that defined the Soviet style of animation, and artists Alexander Ivanov and Dmitry Babichenko, making a shift towards animated films that employ agitprop and socialist realism. Ivan Ivano opened and headed a workshop under the Soviet art faculty, which became the first official Russian workshop where students could study animation. His first students included Lev Milchin, Evgeny Migunov and Anatoly Sazanov. With the start of World War II, the studio was evacuated with key animators who continued teaching students and producing films, mostly propaganda against fascism. In 1943, they returned to Moscow and released several kids' movies, such as The Tale of Tsar Sultan and The Winter's Tale, which is the last film to use the Soviet three-color filming process before the switch to Akfa color, a series of color film products made by Akfa of Germany, a product similar to French Autochrome. By that time, Tushko's studio had been shut down, and Chekanovsky's studio land film was destroyed by a bomb. These events basically allowed Soyuz Multifilm to have a monopoly over Russian animation. After World War II, resources were very limited. 19 animators from the Soyuz Multifilm team were killed in action in the war. A whole generation of Leningrad animators either disappeared at the war front or died during the siege of Leningrad. Others returned war-worn, like Boris Dyoshkin and Alexander Vinokurov, as both lost their left eyes. Boris Butakov got a bullet stuck in his head and Vladimir Dektyaryov lost his right arm and decided to learn how to animate left-handed. Even so, before 1948, four groups of students graduated. They also continued releasing films that brought them international recognition, such as The Last Letter and The Hump-Packed Horse. These films were actually used by Walt Disney as a teaching tool for his prospective artists afterwards. In 1948, The Champion, a short animated comedy film, was accused of formalism and anthropomorphism morphism during the Cold War anti-Disney campaign. Pretty ironic, considering how much Disney influenced the animation industry earlier. As the art director Evgeny Migunov remembered, he floutingly drew backgrounds for his next movie, Polkan and Shavka, as realistic as possible to make up for the backlash. This suddenly became standard for the next 10 years. Ironically, this would become one of the leading innovators in Russian animation later on. For the decade between 1950 and 1960, the vast majority of animated films were fairy tale adaptations, implementing Disney's conveyor method of production, despite the Cold War anti Disney campaign from earlier. Productions had clear work split along with the full analog of a multiplane camera. Eclair, their version of rotoscoping, also rose to popularity during this time. Some directors made excessive use of this method, others mixed it with handmade animation, as in The Snow Queen arguably the most famous work of the time. Many others focused on animal art, using little to no use of rotoscoping. All of this allowed for a yearly release of prominent feature films with high production values. These films included The Night Before Christmas, The Snow Maiden, The Enchanted Boy, The Frog Princess, The Twelve Months, and The Adventures of Buratino. In the early 60s, a whole line of formalistic features hit the screens, such as It Was I Who Drew the Little Man, The Key, Cipollino, and The Wild Swans. The Wild Swans was the first Soviet feature that introduced Gothic art style. Ivan Ivano also broke new grounds with The Flying Proletary, the first widescreen stop-motion short based on the poems and art of Vladimir Mayakovsky that made use of bas-relief paper dolls. Fyodor Kitruk, at that same point, made a directorial debut with the primitivistic cutout short The Story of a Crime. It told a contemporary crime story and gained international acclaim. Fyodor Kitruk's other films, which were Boniface's Holidays, Film, 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 and a trilogy of his own take on Vinnie the Pooh, were a considerable success with both children and adults. In the following years, many animators turned away from the conveyor 
method of production and decided to develop their own distinctive approaches and styles. The number of released titles per year rose through the mid-60s, the 70s and 80s, up to 50 distinct releases per year. Miniseries and anthologies became more common, while the amount of feature films decreased dramatically. Director Boris Stepantsev rose to prominence and became known for his experimental animation. Among his films was another postmodern comedy, Vovka in the Far Far Away Kingdom, the Paint on Glass animation, Song of the Falcon, the highly popular Carlson on the Roof duology that made use of serography and an adaptation of The Nutcracker that presented a familiar story without a single spoken word. One animator who gained some attention was Andrei Krezanovsky, whose surrealist film The Glass Harmonica was censored and banned for quite some time. Another animator who gained acknowledgement was Roman Kachanov, who started with stop-motion animation like A Little Frog is Looking for His Father, The Mitten, and his most famous creation, the Chiburashka series. He has even dabbled in traditional animation with the science fiction feature The Mystery of the Third Planet. Adventures of Mowgli miniseries by Roman Davidov was released from 1967 to 1971. It was not made as a response to any other versions, but it followed the original plot closely, appearing adult and spiritually close to the source material. In 1973, the shorts were combined into a 96-minute feature. The final year of the 60s saw the creation of arguably the most famous animation to come out of Russia. Nupogadi, or, well, just you wait, directed by Vyacheslav Katyonochkin. The cartoon was named Well, Just You Wait because it was an often repeated catchphrase on the show. These seemingly simple shorts about a wolf chasing a hare through Soviet-style cartoony worlds have gotten greatly popular thanks to the quality of their animation, the varied soundtrack and the cunning subtext built into their animated shorts. Gennady Sokolsky focused on films with ambient soundtracks and attractive characters, Silver Hoof, Little Mouse Peak and The Adventures of Lolo the Penguin, the last of which is a Soviet-Japanese feature co-directed with Kenji Yoshida. Leonid Nosirev explored North Russian folklore with a number of ethnographical films. Seven of them were combined into the feature film known as Laughter and Grief by the White Sea. One of the most famous Russian animators is Yuri Norstein. Thanks to his films Little Hedgehog in the Fog and Tale of Tales, they won numerous awards at international festivals, and Tale of Tales was named the best animation film of all time at the 1984 Olympic Arts Festival in Los Angeles. Since the beginning of Perestroika, which was political movement for reformation within the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Nordstein has been working on the overcode, which is sadly so far unfinished, having been in production for an astonishing 40 years. Vladimir Tarasov was a rare Soviet director who dedicated himself to sci-fi. Among his works were Shooting Range, Contract, The Pass and Contact, the last of which was influenced by the Beatles' Yellow Submarine. Stanislav Sokolov, on the other hand, brought stop-motion to a new height. His approach, characterized by complex animation structures and multiple special effects, could be experienced throughout watching the award-winning Black and White film, or The Big Underground Ball. During later years, fewer animated films were produced due to a lack of financing from the government. Gary Bardin, who specialized on stop-motion films by using everyday objects like matches, ropes and wire, was one of the few directors who managed to cope with the financial depletion. His Grey Wolf and Little Red Riding Hood alluded heavily to the upcoming end of the USSR. As the Russian animation landscape began to change, there was a small Soviet animation studio called Pilot that cropped up in Moscow. It was the first private Soviet animation studio, and it aimed to both create auteur and commercial animation producing absurd adult-themed films. What was truly significant about the studio is that several years later, half of the team left Russia to take animation jobs in the US under a company that wanted to stylize their cartoons more in the vein of European artwork. That's right, these animators went to Klasky Chupo and worked on shows like Rugrats and Are Real Monsters, 
After the end of the Soviet Union, the situation for Russian animators changed dramatically. Due to the new management and the lack of funding, many of them left Soyuz Multfilm for greener pastures. In 1993, Yuri Nordstein, Fyodor Kitruk, Andrei Krizanovsky, and Edward Nazarov founded the Shar Studio, meant for training animators and producing films. Gary Bardin founded the Steyer Animation Studio, where he continued directing claymation and stop motion films. Others joined Pilot, Christmas films, animation magic, and similar companies that lived on advertisement and commissioned works for big studios from Western countries. In 1992, films by Jav, an American company ran by Oleg Vidov, and his wife Joan Borsten signed a nine-year contract with the new Soyuz Multifilm director that gave them exclusive distribution and editing rights for a major part of the studio's collection. They were supposed to share incomes, but that would have only happened after their expenses had been paid off. As a result, animators received nothing for their works. In 1993, they elected a new director, allegedly shady businessman Sergei Skulyabin, who promised to turn the studio into a joint stock company. Instead, Skulyabin signed a new contract with Vidov, extending it from 9 to 20 years and returning a number of unprofitable films. His plan was to sell exclusive rights for all past and future films to his dummy corporation and bankrupt Soyuz Multifilm itself. When animators realized the situation, they managed to overthrow Skulyabin with help from the Union of Cinematographers and Goskino, although the Ministry of State Property still refused to step in and appropriate the studio from private ownership. Skulyabin has refused to leave the director's chair up until June 1999, when Sergei Stepashin finally signed a long-awaited order that turned Soyuz Multifilm into a public enterprise. By that time, production had completely stopped. There were still some successful international co-productions despite the destabilization of the Russian economy at the time, like Shakespeare, The Animated Tales, and Alexander Petrov's Oscar-winning The Man and the Sea. In 2004, Russia started airing a funny animal show called Kikoriki, which you might know as Gogoriki when it was owned by four kids for English distribution. It lasted until 2012, but it did gain some international attention, and even a movie being another international hit for Russia, regaining some popularity when it re-merged on Netflix Netflix, which we will get back to later. As for Soyuz Multifilm, in 2001, the Supreme Court of Arbitration of Russia returned the rights to the whole collection back to Soyuz Multifilm, which led to a long legal battle with films by Jov. In 2007, Vidov and Borsten agreed to sell the Soyuz Multifilm collection to the Russian business magnate Alisher Usmanov, who donated it to the state-run children's channel BB Gone. Around the same time, Soyuz Multifilm came back to life. As Russia's economic situation became increasingly stable, so did the market for animation. A number of feature-length animated films from Russian studios emerged, such as Melnitsa Animation Studios, Little Long Nose, and Solnichny Dom Studios, Prince Vladimir, based on the early history of the Russian's people. While the Russian animation community is yet far from reaching the state of affairs before the end of the Soviet Union, a significant recovery was happening. They eventually began to release CGI films like The Snow Queen, and Sheep and Wolves, and even started airing a CGI TV show called Masha and the Bear. The show's use of pantomime helped to get it exported to other countries, using Netflix as a source of distribution, as well as for other Russian cartoons, allowing people to maybe possibly discover some foreign cartoons. And that is quite a history. I'm sure there is much more I could talk about, but we probably would be here forever if that were the case. Frankly, I'm just glad to get the word out there, if only to have more people be aware about Soviet art, which is both bizarre and breathtaking. It is honestly nice to look over many of these shows and movies. Many of them make me appreciate animation more than ever. So now that it is done, I would like to hear what you thought of this video. Did you like the animation that was discussed? Were there any pieces of animation that I missed? Are you now considering checking out any of the movies or shows I displayed here? And beyond that, what other countries would you like for me to highlight and explore animation-wise? Any particular shows or movies you want me to spread the word about from each country? It would be nice to have suggestions in this case. So anyway, this has been Anton and you've been watching non-animated cartoons. До свидания!